Spartans may be at the center of Halo's branding and merchandising, but an argument could be made that the center of Halo's games are the men and women of the UNSC. It's people, it's fighters, it's marines, the humans at the end of an extraterrestrial barrel. They're why Spartans fight, and since the franchise's inception, they've been a core pillar. In today's evolution video, we're going to be taking a look at the most important aspect of the Halo universe, the friendliest armed forces this side of the sun, Halo's Marines. Sir, yes, sir! We all have our fondest memories of the Marines, so in the comments section I encourage you to share your nostalgic memories in which Marines are your personal favorite. Not everyone I list technically counts as a Marine, such as the Army Troopers of Halo Reach, but the term Marine is used as a name for any human NPCs typically found in Halo's levels, so I'll be doing that here as well. A like and a share would do wonders to help the channel, and consider becoming a member, or checking out the Late Night Gaming Discord. With that being said, it's time to get tactical. You want to know what else is tactical? Today's sponsor! This video is possible thanks to the fine folks at Skillshare. For those who don't know, Skillshare is one of the biggest and widely used communities for growing your own personal list of skills or learning a whole new set of skills. The list of classes range from art to music to programming, game design, and so much more. Best part is, new premium classes are added each week, so Skillshare has a little something for everyone. My knowledge on graphics and lighting rivals that of a doorknob, so it's fantastic then that Skillshare even offers classes for those topics, such as lighting a moody nighttime scene by Evan Coates. Use the link down below to get a free month of Skillshare and explore the service for yourself and also enjoy a completely ad-free and high-quality experience. A thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring the video, and now let's get back to the topic. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, the development of the first Halo game was quite a fascinating and iterative story. Many prototypes existed that ranged from a StarCraft-like RTS game to an action-heavy open-world third-person shooter before ending up as the groundbreaking FPS we all know today. Through all the different prototypes and concepting, one thing remained constant. A human military versus the alien and strange. The world of the human race followed the style of cassette futurism, with a splash of anime influences courtesy of artist Shi Kai Wang, whose sketches and work provided enough direction to go off of. As time went on, the Marines leaned more and more into that cassette futurism look, and the strong influence of James Cameron's Aliens found its way into the project, creating a rowdy cast of loudmouth, joke-slinging Marine characters that would accompany the player in most levels of the lengthy campaign. The gear and kit of Halo 1's Marines are most known for the heavy emphasis on grey coloration, plates, helmets with earpieces, and the unique heads-up display eyepiece that assisted them when aiming. Some even personalized their gear, wearing boonies and rolling up their sleeves in swampy locations. As I mentioned before, the Marines of Halo Combat Evolved were more than just no-nonsense soldiers. They each had strong personalities, and even had names such as Mendoza, Vicente, Stacker, and the ill-fated Jenkins, just to name a few. Their various faces were taken from scans of Bungie's own employees at the time, inserting the people behind the code into the game world itself. The personality and camaraderie between the Marines was considered a highlight of the game, but the father figure of the Marines was the charismatic sniper sergeant Johnson, voiced by David Scully. What we will let them have is a belly full of lead and a pool of their own blood to drown in! Am I right, Marines? Sir, yes, sir! Mm -hmm. Damn right I am. Now move it out! Double time! Sergeant Johnson was your charismatic badass sergeant archetype, never passing up an opportunity to hype up the men around him with profanity, jokes, and he's honestly interesting enough that he'll get his own video one day. UNSC forces can also be found wearing workmen's uniforms on board the UNSC Pillar of Autumn, such as Sam, who meets an untimely demise at the hands of some elites. Concept art for the crewmen followed the typical anime art style, but the final game has the crewmen sporting jumpsuits that are closer in spirit to the multicolored bobs of the Marathon franchise. One concept even had Marines donning pressurized spacesuits when piloting fighter crafts during cutscenes, but these never made the cut. Models do exist, however. During gameplay, the Marines are often found armed with the game's iconic assault rifle. In a fight on their own, they tend to err on the side of caution, maintaining their position and rolling or dodging when possible. Throughout any given level are hundreds of individual points called 
firing points. These firing points are spots in the world that allow AI to make choices. If you see a marine running to a spot in a level, it's on the move to one of these firing points, and inside its little low-poly head are dozens of things it's considering. Is there an enemy? Is there a grenade? Where are my friends? Should I hold back? This allows the Marines to make any number of choices during combat while they move from firing point to firing point. Some of these choices even include assisting the player's advances through a level and on occasion manning a Warthog turret, riding shotgun in that Warthog, or even driving the Covenant ghosts before accidentally running over the player. They may seem primitive by today's AI standards, but the key to lifelike AI is all about the illusion of intelligence, and how the developers script that into their levels. When combining excellently expressive reactions such as pointing, waving at the player, panicking and cheering during specific jumps, the Marines of Halo Combat Evolved were quite an accomplishment. The goal, according to Bungie, was to craft a battle simulation that felt immersive, a place where the actors and creatures in these wars felt in some way real and lifelike. During the campaign, Bungie littered the levels with specific marines that use specific animations, such as the injured marines that litter the halls of the Pillar of Autumn during the Covenant's attack. But the most famous of these marines was a single, hostile marine. This marine survived the horrifying flood outbreak found in the bowels of the ring, and in a state of hysteria, he opens fire on the player, screaming at the player to stay back. During development, it was considered to have this marine end himself if the player walked away but this never made the cut. A lot of work went into the immersive qualities of the Marines, and the experience of fighting alongside such expressive and emotionally readable AI definitely achieved that goal. Part of this immersion even included how the Marines responded to players who got maybe a bit sadistic. The Marines may be your best friend, but if not treated right, they will turn on you and defend themselves, which only further led to the feeling of Halo Combat Evolves AI feeling more lifelike. They even understood when the player turned on them and broke script. Pissing off your fellow Marines during gameplay is good fun and all, but the story itself would occasionally bend to fit the player's inputs. In the first level, if the player decides to unload some frustration into Captain Keys using his own handgun, the Marines will respond in force. What the hell are you doing? Security to the bridge. The Master Chief has gone rampant. Take him down, boys. In the second level, when failing to save Marines, Cortana will acknowledge the player's failure with thinly veiled disgust. They're all dead. The glue that held the campaign of Halo 1 together were the Marines that you fought alongside, providing a simulated battle experience with reactive and lifelike Marine actors that felt believable to players. If you ask someone what their favorite memories of the first Halo game were, chances are they'd immediately recount tales of keeping their Marine squad alive and escaping intense situations without losing a single man. The Marines stole the show, but one Marine that stole the show in Halo Combat Evolved wasn't even part of the game. At the end of the campaign, Cortana remarks that nobody survived the destruction of Halo. All she picked up was dust and echoes. The community misheard her poetic dialogue as her literally telling the player that a man by the name of Dustin Echoes was still out there. Bungie was flooded with so many questions about the fate of Dustin Echoes that he became one of Halo's first memes. Did anyone else make it? Here it is. Scanning. Just Dustin Echoes. Dustin Echoes. We'll go back for him. <laughs> the Master Chief may have been cool, but most will remember the men and women of the UNSC who stood their ground against the combined forces of the Covenant. And their journey started here, in Halo 1, with a beautiful first step. Halo Combat Evolved was famously a game Bungie released and then felt confident to walk away from. But when the humble little Xbox shooter became not just a critical, but a commercial success, a sequel was pretty much a given. During the early design process, Bungie looked towards market trends at the time. The rise of tactical franchises like Ghost Recon saw the shooter industry move slowly in the direction of gritty, militaristic experiences, and Bungie wanted to follow suit. This was also motivated by the criticism those who were more military savvy levied at the small development team. The Marines of Halo 2 began development as the gritty, 80s-style Marines we all knew and loved, 
but a lot changed as development went on. Work was put into refining the UNSC aesthetic to seem more like a futurized modern military. The goal of familiarity to real-world armed forces was further inspired by the game's story, which saw players explore stranger and even more alien corners of the Halo universe. As Joe Staten said, when we launched players on an epic space adventure, we wanted them to immediately feel at home driving a human vehicle or holding human weapons. By rooting UNSC military hardware in the familiar, we created space to explore the exotic. Bungie's animation team also took a trip to South Carolina in the United States for reference material being shown live demonstrations on how personnel operate, communicate, and use their weapons. All of this research, feedback, and ambition was funneled into a new look for the UNSC. Gone were the boonies and James Cameron influences, and in was a military for the 26th century. Despite their new look, the cassette futurism was certainly not gone. The UNSC very much did still sport that classic, what was old is now new aesthetic, but their uniforms, battle chatter, and even greater world building gave the sense that the soldiers of Earth were not just a ragtag group of charismatic goofballs anymore, plucked from a Vietnam War-inspired sci-fi action movie. Now they were a proper, multi-planet armed forces. The dress code for the Marines saw an update. Adopting ceremonial white jackets and dress pants during the game's opening ceremony, militaristic greens and tans when in combat, complete with buckles and straps to hold various pouches for ammunition and supplies. Sometimes they'll carry radio equipment, and their reliable helmets saw a new design, one that was more angular and less bowl-like. Unfortunately, one bit of kit that did get the axe were the tactical eyepieces the Marines wore. They're nowhere to be seen in Halo 2. The production value of Halo 2's Marines also saw a bump beyond just their armor. More ethnicities could be found, and for the first time in the series, both men and women fought alongside the Chief with a host of new animations, simulation behaviors, and moves such as using cover and more intense impact animations, some of which include sneaky references to famous war fiction such as Band of Brothers. Other behaviors include setting up turret encampments at scripted moments, allowing the player to trade weapons, That hurts, Chief. That hurts real bad. Losing their helmet upon taking a headshot, as well as, finally, driving the player around in multi-man vehicles. These new abilities greatly increased the simulational aspects of the campaign that helped make the first Halo feel so immersive. Of course, the player can still betray them, but this just leads to heavy retaliation. You knew it was coming. <laughs> Many favorites return from Halo 1, such as Andrew McCage's Australian Chips Dubbo, Pete Stacker's confident and stoic Sergeant Stacker, but the Marine family grew just a bit larger thanks to the vocal talent of Michelle Rodriguez and David Cross. And we will be too, sir, if we don't get the hell out of here! The daughter of the previous game's Captain Keys, Miranda, and returning favorite Sergeant Johnson become fully-fledged main characters, serving both gameplay roles and main narrative roles during cutscenes. Other types of Marines could be found in the campaign, such as ODSTs, or Pelican Pilots, but they're interesting enough that they'll get their own video one day. Halo 2 was an ambitious game, with a development cycle that held it back from its full potential. It speaks, then, to the talent of the developers that it's still regarded as one of the best games of all time, and despite the stresses the developers were under, they never lost sight of one of the key building blocks of a solid Halo campaign, the simulated soldiers you fight alongside. And this is a building block Bungie would continue to solidify with the finale of the Halo trilogy. The closure of Bungie's Halo trilogy took place on the then next generation of Xbox, the Xbox 360. It gave them the horsepower and flexibility to bring the Halo universe to life in ways the previous console couldn't. Things such as AI, the size of the battlefields, complexity in physics simulation, and the lighting engine all saw a serious upgrade, and an upgrade is what the Marines got as well. The jump from Halo 1 to 2 was a bit more of a redesign. The jump from Halo 2 to 3 could be best described as a refinement. 
The Marines of Halo 3 keep much of the militaristic vibe that Halo 2 was going for, but refining things such as the shape of the helmets, chest area, and shoulders with more clearly defined and form complementing plates of armor. Straps and their BDUs were made a brighter color to contrast nicely against the dark green of the plating. It was quite a solid look for the Marines. It bridged the militaristic Halo 2 incarnation with the more anime, Vietnam inspiration of their original artwork and combat evolved appearance, and it crafted a design that would go on to influence the depiction of Halo's Marines for years to come. Many returning Marines from the past even saw updates such as Sergeant Stacker's Marcus Leto inspired face, or Sergeant Johnson whose new, more flexible face allowed for a greater range of expressions. Stay sharp! These being benefits that also extended to the returning Miranda Keys. As far as variety was concerned, the Marines of Halo 3 were the most complex in the series with more models and characters than ever before. Halo 3's campaign is one of survival. The UNSC is on the extreme back foot as the Covenant occupy most of Africa. The UNSC is now hiding out in old bunkers, using outdated equipment, and clearly exhausted from constant fighting. Some sport rolled up sleeves, headdresses, injuries, and more. The jumpsuited Marines even make a return from Halo 1, featuring new high-quality jumpsuits and even the same marathon coloration. In terms of their gameplay, the Marines of Halo 3 were the most complex up to that point, with more behaviors, stronger pathfinding, and decision-making when reaching their firing points, more coordinated attacks such as throwing grenades as a squad, and much more. Their weapon skills were also dramatically improved with more accurate rocket handling, and their driving skills were sharper than ever before, which made them less risky of a bet during the game's numerous vehicle sequences. The power of the Xbox 360 also allowed Bungie to place more of them in any given situation and make more extensive use of physics objects in the environment, whereas before, Halo's marine AI was held back by technical constraints and development limitations, they now took the skies in aerial vehicles of their own, dogfighting overhead or supporting the player on the ground in massive numbers. They would open doors for the player, toggle consoles during specific moments, and of course instantly turn their gun on the player when detecting a whiff of insubordination. This new AI even translated to civilian characters in the campaign, such as the factory workers found in the level The Storm. The campaign also saw an increase in scripted sequences involving the Marines. Marines can be found being tortured and viciously killed by the brutes across the levels, which if fast enough, can be rescued, and when the flood make a horrifying landfall on Earth. One Marine survivor is so hysterical that he contemplates joining his infected comrades who he had to put down just moments before the player's arrival. A clear nod to the terrified Marine of the first game. In Halo 3's sister game, Halo 3 ODST, no changes were made to their pathfinding or behaviors. What changes did come to those Marines were not behaviors, but rather world building. New Mombasa's police force also took to the streets of Africa to fight back the invading alien army, utilizing the same AI behaviors and animations as the Marines. The campaign of ODST allowed players to expose the deep corruption within the NMPD, which would cause a seemingly friendly police officer to turn on the player, desperate to tie up any loose ends. The Marines of Halo 3 were the culmination of years of technological and artistic evolution, bit by bit, Halo's Marines fleshed out the mold established by the first game. Simulated fighters, fellow troopers, and across the Halo trilogy, the Marines were always there, backing the player up. They became smarter with each entry, more numerous, more funny, more clever, and at times, more human. No way! A Spartan? For real! You better not be- Oh man, he's here! We're gonna be Where did right. you find him? Napping. Out back. <laughs> I'll bet. It's good to see you, Chief. Likewise, ma'am. With the war over, the Marines of Halo could breathe easy before entering a new age with new interpretations, and that new age would begin in the past. As the game industry progressed into the 2010s, graphics for console games were improving at an astonishing rate, and the shooter market in general was following the wake left by the runaway success of the new Modern Warfare series. For Bungie's final Halo game, they too would throw their hat into the ring and paint a version of the Halo universe diving deeper than ever before into that modern military aesthetic started in Halo 2. 
When concepting the UNSC of Halo Reach, at the time Bungie artist Isaac Hannaford used women as a template due to him growing rather tired of drawing the Master Chief over and over again. The designs expanded to men too, and the look of the Marines for Halo Reach began to take form. But ah, I said Marines, which isn't quite correct, because in Halo Reach, the stars of the show are not the Marines, but the army troopers of Planet Reach herself. Reach's army troopers vaguely resemble the Marines found in previous games. The helmets take on a decidedly more rounded shape thanks to the higher poly count. Due to the increase in detail allowed by the new Halo engine, finer details could be made on the armor such as the troopers' blood types which are displayed on their shoulders in the event they are injured and need emergency blood transfusions on the field. The army battle uniforms come in a variety of configurations such as face covers, camouflage, bags of ammo strapped to their persons, and sniper rounds affixed to their shoulders. They can also be found with visors on their eyes and occasionally the long lost eyepiece from Halo 1. The Army Troopers of Reach embodied a decade of Halo's marine design language, crafting an incredibly charismatic take on Halo's famous friendly AI characters, but they weren't the only forces fighting alongside the player. Reach's Air Force assisted the player in many ways during the campaign as well, but it wasn't until the finale of the campaign when Halo's UNSC Marines arrived in full force, being deployed to assist in delivering Cortana to the UNSC Pillar of Autumn, which was getting ready to evac the planet and take the characters to the famous Halo ring where the series started. During gameplay, the Army, ODST, and Marine forces could become tethered to the player via a subtle and often missed mechanic, the fire team system. If the player looks at their motion tracker, they can see the names of soldiers that are part of the player's fire team. If losing a member, new AI could join that fire team when encountering the player. The fire team mechanic did very little beyond this and existed more as a way to humanize the soldiers around you. In fact, Eagle-eyed players may notice the names of the men and women fighting alongside you are names that were shared by Bungie developers as well as notorious community members at the time such as Red vs. Blue's production team. Bungie would leave the series following the release of Halo Reach, destined to walk in the light of other stars. But for the Halo fanbase, Bungie's final goodbye to the Marines of Halo were as solid as ever. Following the departure of Bungie from the series, Halo's multimedia studio, 343 Industries, was handed the reins of the mainline games, and they sought to explore the future of the Halo universe and the state of the Milky Way galaxy following the events of the war. As Josh Holmes, 343's at the time creative director, recalled, there was a desire to portray a version of the Halo universe that was more serious and grounded. During production, there was some exploration done in crafting a look for the Marines that was more in continuity with the series, building upon their armors from Halo 3 into high definition. But this was ultimately abandoned, and what players got when meeting up with Marines was something new and entirely different. Kenneth Scott was responsible for the rewritten design language for the Reclaimer era of Halo that 343 started, and when designing the UNSC, the Aliens-inspired cassette futurism designs were replaced with smooth, rounded, and brightly colored plastics and polymers, and much of that anime-slash-Vietnam War stylization was replaced with Western science fiction. Welcome to the UNSC of the Reclaimer Saga. The Marines of Halo 4 are more inspired by late Iraq War soldier fatigues and Western science fiction. The bulky plates, eyepieces, radio equipment, and distinct helmets were replaced with more rounded helmets, strapped on Kevlar, and brightly colored patterns on their BDUs. There is also quite a lot of variation found throughout the campaign, such as the paintball-like heavy infantry units, the white and red medics, the field sergeants with their caps, and the occasional security forces, which some of 343's own employees grew to call marshmallow heads. The Marines of Halo 4 tonally are quite similar to those found in Halo Reach. They take their duties quite seriously, leaving the jokes for later. This doesn't, however, mean they're entirely cold. They often greet the player with admiration, surprise, and enthusiasm, and give off the impression that they're deeply honored to be fighting alongside the Master Chief. They'll salute the player when walking by and during the story, 
When Chief defies his commanding officer, the Marines will all quietly voice their support for the Chief as he walks by them on his way to face danger. Halo 4 is a bit unusual as a Halo game in that it rarely features Marine companions, which is why it does come as such a nice breath of fresh air when the player finally encounters them on the surface of the Forerunner Shield World Requiem. How are they in gameplay though? They unfortunately struggle quite a bit in the AI department. When behind the wheel of a vehicle or in the gunner seat of a warthog, they're quite similar to their Reach counterparts, but when on foot, limitations are noticed. The new 343 animations are noticeably less expressive than the Bungie titles, and in general they seem less responsive to stimuli than past titles, giving them a robotic-like stiffness when engaged in firefights or simply moving from firing point to firing point in the levels. One specific behavior that handicaps them quite a bit is what seems to be either a bug or a misunderstanding on 343's programmer's part. In the Bungie titles, Marines had a behavior that would allow them to occasionally taunt fallen enemies, unloading a few rounds into the bodies while yelling out some insults. In Halo 4, this behavior has mutated into a compulsion to not just put a few shots in as a taunt, but unload magazine after magazine into the enemies, long after they're dead, sometimes even opening themselves up to other enemies, and it takes quite a bit of coaxing to get them to ease up on the old trigger when they begin ignoring living enemies and going after the already dead ones. It is worth mentioning, however, that despite the many downgrades to the Marines of Halo 4, 343 Industries still remembered to respect player agency. Yes, you can team kill in this game and the Marines will retaliate. They'll have a lot less of an aggressive response to betrayal, and the narrative unfortunately doesn't bend to accommodate this brief moment of player insanity, but the developers did what they could here to keep the gameplay gag alive and ensure the simulational aspects of the Marines stay relatively intact, even if in a diminished sense. Following the story, players would take their own Spartan back to the Forerunner Shield world in the game's Spartan Ops missions. Like Halo 4's main campaign, the Marines of Spartan Ops are also mostly sidelined, with Spartans being the star of the show. But the Marines do show up in a handful of Spartan Ops missions to help the player. The Reclaimer saga of Halo marked a time of growth for the UNSC. Technology advanced at an unprecedented scale. Humanity flexed their muscles without the stress of extinction looming over them, and things finally seemed to be looking up for the human race. But in 2015, 343 released the final chapter of the Reclaimer saga, Halo 5 Guardians. Years of books, comics, and even miniseries showed that in the years following the end of the Human Covenant War, Peace was perhaps not the word to describe the state of the galaxy. The UNSC's outer colonies were growing increasingly frustrated with what they saw as an authoritarian and controlling system. The elite species was embroiled in a state of civil war, and in the story of Halo 5, players would explore the bursting point as the galaxy erupted into a war against itself. Rather curiously, Halo 5's campaign features no Marines of any kind during its 15-mission campaign. Instead, players would fight alongside non-Marines for a majority of the single player. On the glass planet of Meridian, the Liang Dortmund Corporation was deep into a 20-year mission to rehabilitate the planet's ecosystem, and across the surface, various miners, workers, and security forces can be encountered. The miners sport the admittedly goofy-looking mining gear that keeps them safe from the toxins and microglass they would breathe in on a daily basis, while Liang Dortmund's security forces wear corporate-branded security equipment that doesn't look too dissimilar from the busy-looking fatigues found on the Reclaimer Saga Marines. The security forces and miners of Meridian use the animations and AI of Halo 4, which unfortunately includes many of the same pathfinding, AI, and animation issues. In the game's Warzone mode, proper Marines can be found, sporting the marshmallow head armor in either blue or red colors depending on the team they fight for. Their firing points are locked to bases scattered around the maps, which means they will make no attempt to leave or pathfind beyond their base, and if knocked out of their bases, they'll make a simple beeline back to their firing points in the same safety of the bases. They'll also make no attempt to join the player in vehicles and will refuse to swap weapons. Weirdly enough, this being a quirk with female miners and security forces in the game's campaign. The Marines and armed NPCs of Halo 5 unfortunately also had their ability to turn on the player removed. Kill them as much as you'd like, 
they'll never lift a finger to defend themselves. The game's T for Teen rating also placed heavy restrictions on violence done to humans, so a marine taking damage is nothing more than a series of harmless sparks, a far cry from the comedic violence of the previous games. For the most part, marines seemed more like an afterthought in Halo 5 Guardians. The few times they did show up in the game's campaign, they were rather underwhelming, and their Warzone integration reduced them to more or less just mobile turrets. The simulated comrades that Bungie built the marines up into over the course of many games were reduced to something, ironically, quite artificial. But like most low points, this can provide an opportunity for growth. But before we look at that growth, let's talk about spin-off material. The Marines of Halo made various appearances beyond the mainline game, such as a quite memorable pre-release Halo 1 commercial, where a Marine sells the viewer on the mind-blowing power of the cutting-edge NVIDIA GeForce 2 GTS. Wow, what a smooth frame rate. Other Marines, such as Johnson, of course, would go on to become a bit of a marketing icon for the original trilogy, pitching gamers a variety of awesome experiences, such as the E3 demo for Halo 2, or ODST's firefight mode. Interestingly, the marketing of Halo didn't just consist of in-engine shenanigans. As the Halo trilogy grew more and more successful and its marketing budget got bigger and bigger, live-action marketing films such as Landfall go to great lengths to portray the Halo 3 Marines in realistic combat, showing that those low-poly armors translate beautifully into live-action. The Believe trailers for Halo 3 feature interviews with veterans of the Human Covenant War years after the events of the games, who recount the heroics of the player during the game's various campaigns. The Halo 3 Marine Armor was also made available for Xbox avatars. It's around this time that Halo began to branch out beyond Bungie, such as Halo Wars, the first non-Bungie-developed Halo title. Its take on the Marines were quite memorable. The CGI cutscenes of the game, done by Blur Studios, painted a version of the UNSC that was quite edgier than the incarnations of past, with a heavy focus on shoulder pads, bulky chest armor, and sharper helmets with facial coverings and tactical visors. Bookmark this design, because we're going to be returning to it. The anime anthology series Halo Legends featured a variety of shorts, but one of the most memorable was about a marine who dons a powerful prototype Spartan suit to defend the civilians trying to evacuate the doomed world. No pun intended, it was a cool full circle moment for the series, bringing the marines right back to their anime influences. For the remake of Halo Combat Evolved, Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary, a mismatch of assets that ranged from Halo 3 all the way to Halo Reach were used. For the marines, Modified Reach army troopers were used, which unfortunately didn't quite capture the same essence of the Halo 1 Marines too well. Poor Johnson himself walked away from the game looking a bit like Super Mario, more than the charismatic sniper sergeant we all know and love. Thankfully, the remake Halo 2 Anniversary did a much better job at capturing the artistic intent of the original game, but similar to the first remake's Marines, the Marines of Halo 2 Anniversary don't sport new models designed in the spirit of the original assets. It instead puts those CGI Marines from Halo Wars to good work, sporting new face models and removing the facial covering. Johnson himself got quite the glow up as well. His body is that of the Halo Wars CGI Marine, but the face was modeled off of actor Damien Poitier with Miranda Keyes' new face being provided by actress Courtney Munch. For the HD port of Halo 3 found on the Master Chief Collection, many improvements were made to the contents of the game, but like all ports, some bugs slipped through the cracks. Sergeant Stacker's face is bugged, making his Marcus Lado face appear as a sickly white pale for some odd reason. In less buggy news, when Halo Reach was officially added to the Master Chief Collection, 343 Industries took the time to add new names to the fireteam mechanic. Many Marines encountered in the campaign now sport the names of not just Bungie folk, but 343 employees as well. Alongside the man, the myth, the legend, Dustin Echoes. There he is, Marty. He's alive and well in Halo Reach. Halo 4's promotional material, like Halo 3's Believe, went to great lengths in humanizing the men and women of the UNSC. The film Forward Unto Dawn acted as the origin story for one of Halo 4's main characters, as his training facility is attacked by the Covenant, while the Infinity trailer showed the terror of those on board the UNSC flagship Infinity as it tumbled to the Forerunner world where the game took place. 
In 2016, the Halo Wars series was announced to be making a surprise return to gamers' hands. The game would split marine duties across two different designs. The blur CGI cutscenes of Halo Wars 2 sport the Halo 2 anniversary models, which themselves were Halo Wars 1 assets, but the gameplay would feature a modified marshmallow head design, with small tweaks to make them a bit more in line with the game's RTS art style. Due to the RTS nature of the game, a variety of other marine types can be found that sport incredibly exaggerated armor styles to be better seen from the bird's eye view, such as the UNSC sniper unit, which appears to have gotten his head caught in an air fryer. Returning to the world of live action for a minute, Paramount Plus's Halo show takes design cues from a wide range of Halo assets. The Marines in particular, in a rather interesting twist, take quite a bit of inspiration from 80s and 90s science fiction, as well as the Marines of Halo 1, crafting a weirdly faithful portrayal of Halo's fan-favorite warriors. In a show criticized for its lack of attention to the source material, this is one area where they had a certified win. And now, it's time to turn our eyes to the latest entry in the Halo series. Halo Infinite is the latest entry in the Halo series. After the Reclaimer Saga's conclusion, one of the main goals is to bring Halo back to a place of familiarity for gamers and mainstream audiences with a more traditionally Halo-inspired art style, musical direction, and tone. Fighting across the surface of Zeta Halo are what remains of the UNSC after a crushing defeat by a new alien threat, the Banished. And of course, that means it's time to get a new look at Halo's Marines. The Marines of Halo Infinite take design cues from many different eras, with the most obvious cues being from Halo Reach and Halo 2. It's a design that's more rooted in post-Iraq War soldier fatigues than it is the 80s and 90s colonial marine designs of earlier Halo. But it's a design that landed with resounding success as far as the Halo community was concerned. How are they during gameplay? Well, the Marines of Halo Infinite are quite an interesting story. During development, they weren't even a given. They'd come and go, sometimes being dropped before coming back into development after a few months, and the troubles of getting them to navigate an open world made them quite a production headache. What the Marines of Halo Infinite ended up with is a mixture of Halo 5's Warzone bases and Halo Reach's fireteam system. Throughout the game are forward operating bases, banished structures, marine rescue zones, and other areas of interest that Marines have firing points within. Beyond these areas, though, Marines are unable to dynamically navigate the open world. They refuse to drive vehicles and will generally hang close to their pre-designated zones in the open world. If approached by a player, however, up to five Marines can become tethered to the player who will begin dynamically generating their own firing points, allowing Marines to follow them in the open world. Their new, faster, and more expressive animations also allowed them to appear much more lifelike and reactive in combat. And in general, there's a greater sense of, well, sentience when compared to the Marines found in the Reclaimer Saga games. Marines can also be found tethered up in banished restraints in the open world, and can be freed by the player during moments in the game. During development, the prisoner marines were actually located inside of cages that the banished could be seen transporting during scripted moments in the open world. But these were dropped, most likely due to the act of freeing marines from these cages, not allowing for ranged approaches during gameplay. Players quite enjoyed the Halo Infinite Marines and regarded them as 343's best stab at the simulated buddies. But where the Marines of Halo Infinite do fall short are sadly in those simulational aspects. While Halo 5 removed their ability to retaliate against player hostility, Halo Infinite went a step further and made them impervious to harm from the player. The only way to team kill Marines is by using physics objects such as vehicles or crates, indirectly killing them. And even then, the Marines will have no opinion about this moment of player hostility. The story also never acknowledges the state of your Marine companions. If failing to rescue Marines during rescue missions, the player's AI companion will cheerfully congratulate the player, assuring them that the Marines are thankful. The Marines, whose bodies currently scatter the battlefield. That's why the Marines call you a legend, Chief. Due to the T for Teen rating, brute violence against Marine captives is almost non-existent, making the Marines seem less like prisoners and more like inconvenienced teens. 
teenagers being arrested. Like Halo 5, Marines are relatively bloodless and are never found being physically harmed by their captors. One idea pitched to make the brute seem sadistic in a more PG-13 friendly way was during development having a brute chieftain kicking captive marines off the ring. But this was unfortunately never acted upon due to the resources required to set up a scenario like this in the open world at that point during development. The marines of Halo Infinite fall just a bit short on the simulational side having very video gamey limitations placed on them due to story, technical, and rating reasons. But it didn't stop these Marines from being greatly enjoyed by gamers worldwide, who would frequently load up a full Razorback Warthog with Rocket Marines and take the fight to the Banished. With their charismatic designs, quick-witted humor, and enthusiasm when fighting alongside the player, the Marines of Halo Infinite were considered a highlight of the game's campaign. Again, bringing Halo a bit full circle. Isn't that funny? Whether we remember keeping them alive during our favorite missions, team killing them and trying to survive their wrath, or laughing at the quips and jokes they yelled out during combat, we all have our favorite incarnation of the Marines. The question that remains is, what is your favorite incarnation of the Marines in the series? What things would you like to see an evolution video on? And due to the Marines being just normal people, I'm going to do something a bit different for my impression of a Marine. I'm late night gaming. I'm a Marine now. I'm not an alien. I have ten fingers, ten toes, and I'm definitely not an alien. Oh no! It's a brute! Ah! I'm dead now!